I want to introduce myself. My name is Aaron Reed. I am the Research and Evaluation Officer with the Skoll Foundation. I am excited to be joined here today uh, by uh, three outstanding uh, colleagues. Julia Kaufman, who is the Director of the Center for Evaluation Innovation in Washington, D.C. Annie Duflo, who is the Executive Director of Innovations for Poverty Action. And um, one of our Skoll awardees, uh, Frank Beetle de Paloma, who is the CEO of Mothers to Mothers. I'll let them elaborate on those brief introductions in a moment. <clears throat> but first, I wanted to describe a bit of um, why we're all here today, or at least from my perspective. So um, I've observed over the last few years uh, something that I would call at best an unclear and maybe at worst a counterproductive conversation, especially within philanthropic circles regarding effective strategy and uh, along with it, how and even whether uh, we should go about measuring impact. So uh, this uh, comes as a result of two, what I would call, positioned as competing trends. There has been on one hand, an abundance of conversation about what works. Uh, this has the premise of that we just need to find, test, and replicate solutions to the world's problems. This is, um, involves the language of proof often, that we need to find proven solutions or at least provable solutions. And it also all often involves the language of scale, that once we can find it, prove it, then we can scale it. Um, this trend is uh, visible in the U.S. especially in the White House's Social Innovation Fund, which has this language all over it, as well as USAID's DIV program, which also shares this, this language. Both of those just created in about the past five years. Meanwhile, there has been increasing discussion of what it means to embrace complexity, that there's an acknowledgement that we live and we operate within dynamic ecosystems, and that, that comes with it a reciprocal response to have dynamism within our programs. Um, from this stems the language of adaptation and the language of iteration. You can see it in the, the work of Andrew Zoli and Resilience, which talks about the high volatility uh, that we live in today. Uh, it's the new normal, and as a response, we need softer, more modular infrastructure, um, softer, more modular systems and processes in response. You can also see it in the language of Peter Sim's Little Bets, another book that many of us are aware of, which promotes a kind of continual process of experimentation, learning, and iteration. So these trends of what works and complexity are too often, in my opinion, pitted at odds with one another. They're presented as falsely, in my opinion, binary. That it's fixed versus adaptive. That it's prove versus improve. Worse, I think there's often a value judgment placed on one or other end of the spectrum. That one of these is good, or at least better, and the other is, is worse. So speaking from the perspective of a funder interested in advancing the work of promising organizations, such as the, Sk the Skoll Foundation is, you can find yourself often pulled towards the simplest causal chains. That you're not necessarily finding the most effective or even most replicable, but the simplest, simplest and most provable causal chains. Uh, you can see this, for instance, in, in GiveWell, which takes some flack as a result of this. GiveWell has identified just three um, organizations, um, two of which are deworming because those are the most provable efforts. On the other hand, you might find yourself pulled um, because of an overvaluing of the messiness and the complexity um, of the world that we, that we live in. You can find yourself pulled away from impact assessment pulled away instead in deferring to um, constant adaptation. So um, I saw this played out a few years ago in an online conversation, a public argument between Soros and Gates. 
Um, so Soros criticized the Gates Foundation for over-focusing on vaccinations at the expense of a broader consideration of healthcare systems. Um, Gates responded that vaccinations were the best, most cost-effective way of helping the lives of children. And Soros responded that um, an insistence on measurable achievements can distract you from the, or can even distort the, your perspective on the objective, or even can distort the end results that you end up seeing. So that's the origin of the conversation today. I'm going to now invite my colleagues to share some of their perspective on this same conversation. And then before we start to talk about what we need to do about it, I want to open it up to you all to share some of your takes on this same, this same kind of tension. Julia? Uh, thanks for inviting me to be here. So uh, I'm Julia Kaufman from the Center for Evaluation and Innovation, and we are a small nonprofit that is devoted to uh, trying to build the field of evaluation in areas that are challenging to assess. Um, so where non-traditional approaches to evaluation uh, are needed. And so for us, that means things like, how do you evaluate advocacy or public policy change or systems change efforts? Um, so for example, some of the projects that we are working on now include um, a project to, uh, foundation funded projects to uh, work on governance reform in California. So it's an initiative to try and um, shift how campaigns happen and how, uh, how government works in, in California. So big complex problems or um, working on uh, advocacy on reproductive rights in the US, Latin America, and Africa. Um, and we just started an evaluation for the Hewlett Foundation on a new initiative of theirs to tackle a small problem in the U.S. called uh, political polarization. Um, so, so you can see these are, these are the kinds of, um, of initiatives that Aaron uses the, used the term adaptive initiatives where you don't know the exact strategy. How do you fix polarization? Um, you don't know exactly how to get from point A to point, D, point B and you know that your strategy is gonna to have to adapt quite a bit in response to the context in which it's located, um, in, in, in response to changing political conditions, economic conditions, et cetera. So, so with those kinds of efforts, the question is how do, you, you know, how do you evaluate them? They're not a fixed model. You don't have a fixed intervention. You've got something that you expect is gonna change over time. That is, those aren't the kinds of conditions that um, the sort of traditional discipline of evaluation is set up to, to manage. Um, so what, what we do and what many others in the field have been doing to support our, and evaluate those initiatives is use something called developmental evaluation. Um, just by a quick raise of hands, how many people have heard of developmental? Okay, a, a decent number of you. I'll explain it quickly, you'll, you'll get the concept. Um, it's, it's just the label that may be unfamiliar. But the idea is that evaluation doesn't sit outside of an effort and sort of judge thumbs up, thumbs down, is it working? Uh, evaluation instead is integrated into the initiative and um, is designed to sort of support its evolution over time. So the, if you have an external evaluator, that person is sitting at your strategy and decision-making table all the time, uh, helping you identify what strategic questions you've got, and then going out and, and either helping you collect or collecting um, the data and information you need to support decisions about what to do next, um, to monitor the environment and, and to track um, sort of the evolution of your strategy. Uh, so the, the users in this case are those who are implementing the strategy, making the decisions about it, less about the funders and more about the actual owners of, of the strategy. Um, there's no set methodology to how developmental evaluation works. It depends on the initiative, which makes it kind of complicated. 
um, and the evaluation changes over time. So as new questions come up, you have to abandon things you were working on before um, because they're no longer relevant and adapt, uh, or, sorry, adopt some new uh, methodologies or um, some new data collection efforts to support the new questions. So in that context, the challenge um, for me that's relevant here is that, um, is that it's all good and nice to support those implementing the strategy. That's a, certainly a worthwhile endeavor. But they're still being funded, um, and there are still questions about what are the results? You know, you're putting a lot of money into this effort. It can't just be about learning. It can't just be about adaptation. How do we think about results? How do we think about what's working in the context of this mm -hmm. sort of changing, um, evolving initiative? So that's, that's the problem I'm going to talk about. Thank you. Annie. Hi, well, th thanks very much for uh, having me here. So um, our job at uh, Innovations for Poverty Action is um, much easier because we focus on evaluating things that are somewhat easier to evaluate. So <laughs> I guess we, we, cover the, we try to cover the field among the two of us. Um, so um, what, what we do is that we work in partnership with uh, academic researchers and implementing organizations to uh, identify a uh, number of issues related to poverty, identify or design innovative solutions to these problems, and then we evaluate the impact of those solutions, mostly uh, using a methodology called randomized control trials or RCT. So, so I will also ask you how many people know what an RCT is. Uh, so you all seem very familiar, but um, I'll just uh, for those who may be less familiar, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more. So basically, randomized control trials is the same methodology that's used in the medical field to evaluate uh, the impact of medicines. So the, the idea is that you randomly assign individuals or communities to the intervention that you're trying to evaluate. And what it does is that it isolates the effect of the program, which is what you're interested in, from other factors, whether it's the time or uh, characteristics of beneficiaries um, or changes in, uh, in the environment. Um, so when, when it's possible to use RCTs, but it's not always possible, <laughs> when it is possible, it is one of the cleanest way to evaluate a program's impact because it is a very sort of transparent uh, methodology. So that's, uh, that's what we, we focus on. Um, so thinking about uh, you know, this, this topic of, of complexity, uh, so I, I maybe I'll start by defining what, uh, what complexity is. Oh, I, I wouldn't pretend to, to do that, it's a complex question, but <laughs> let me simplify, <laughs> let me simplify maybe what complexity is. So I actually uh, checked on Wikipedia because I wanted to make sure that I was on topic somehow. <laughs> so um, the you know, simplest definition is something with many parts, where these many parts interact with each other in many different ways. So that's what complexity is. And for me, there are three aspects of, of complexity that are very relevant to this conversation. One is the complexity of human behaviors. So human behaviors are driven by um, economic considerations, cultural considerations, psychological uh, factors, and all of those interact with each other. Then there is the complexity of the environment or, or the context, the cultural consideration, historical uh, aspects, uh, political, um, political and institutional, uh, institutional sort of considerations. And Human behaviors and environments <laughs> together can lead to more or less complex uh, problems. And then finally, there is the complexity of the intervention itself uh, that, that try to address these various problems. Um, there's a very um, interesting blog on this topic by Owen Ozier at the Center for Global Development. Uh, he, he has a very nice table actually mapping out these different uh, aspects of of complexity, uh, that's, that's useful. Um, so when you think of, of interventions and their complexity, it can go from a really complex intervention, like trying to solve um, ethnic conflict, for example, 
two uh, very simple interventions, like distributing bed nets. It's very easy and easily sort of uh, measurable. And then you have sort of everything in, in between. And, and as Owen says in his blog, a lot of interventions in the development field tend to, feel, tend to fall kind of in between. So not the most complex, but not the most simple um, either. And when you think about it, even the simplest interventions in appearance actually kind of fall in between because distributing bed nets sounds like a very simple intervention, but then there is a question of, oh, but people don't use bed nets. Why? How do you get them to use bed nets, which we know work? So even the simplest interventions are actually far more complex and bring in like, all of this human behavior and, and contextual elements that, that I mentioned. Um, so for us, this apparent tension between the type of work we do, randomized control trials, where if you think of randomized control trials in the medical field, it's a very, uh, you know, you need a very clear model or theory of change and you need to you know, have a fairly well-controlled sort of environment and, and intervention to really ensure that you're actually evaluating what you are trying to evaluate. Right? So there is an apparent tension between the kind of work we do and the recognition that the world is, is complex. And um, it's, it's very apparent uh, in, three, in three ways. So the, the first way is that this can, um, and it can, it can go both ways, it can lead to uh, too much focus on evidence-based decision making, or it can move you away from evidence-based decision making. So one perverse consequence um, is that you know, if there is too much focus on evidence-based decision making where evidence is defined as very quantitative evidence, it can actually move you sort of, uh, away from more complex interventions because they cannot be evaluated in a very rigorous way. Uh, and there's a great article by uh, Caroline Finess here in the room that describes this as the money ball of, of philanthropy. Great article. Um, anyway, a, a second um, challenge that, that we face with this tension is that there's often the perception that randomized control trials uh, can not uh, even start to evaluate somewhat complex interventions uh, because, um, because randomized control trials are not able to understand what's in the black box. Right? So there is that perception. Uh, and another perception is that um, our cities lead to very sort of fixed uh, prescriptions that uh, cannot necessarily be, uh, that don't necessarily fit into sort of complex environments uh, where things sort of change and where maybe a more uh, adaptive approach is, uh, is needed. So uh, for me, you know, like Erin, I, I really feel that uh, there is actually not a, a dichotomy uh, and that you know, we have to embrace uh, evidence-based approach to sort of complexity. So for me, there are really two words that I'll talk more about later is like understanding and adapting. And I think that we can work with evidence-based approach to do that. Fantastic. So now we've heard from a couple experts on the evaluation strategy side of things. I want to get down to implementation, somebody who runs programs on the ground. So hello, everybody. Um, I'm hoping my voice will hold out the whole time. Um, <laughs> if not, I'll start drinking lots of water. <laughs> my name is Frank Beetle de Palomo, as Aaron introduced, and I'm the CEO of Mothers to Mothers, which is an NGO based in Cape Town. We are focused on eliminating the transmission of HIV from mother to child and keeping moms alive. <coughs> 11 years old organization. We operate in South Africa, in Lesotho, in Swaziland, Malawi, Kenya, and Uganda. We had former programs in Zambia, in Rwanda, in Tanzania, as well as um, affiliate programs in Ethiopia and Botswana. And I think it's interesting that I sat on the end because I should probably sit right in the middle here um, in terms of this, both from my personal experience but also from the experience of Mothers to Mothers. For those of you who don't know Mothers to Mothers, we have our former CEO is back in the back, if Gene would raise his hand. And yeah. I have my director of business development there, David Torres. Um, so if I say something wrong, please tell me. I've only been there <laughs> since October 1st of 2012, but I think I've, I've definitely have um, been on the fast lane on this process. The organization really started from a very simple innovation or a very, um, obser an observation that women in Southern Africa, at a time when in the Western world we had pretty much already conquered the um, epidemic of pediatric HIV, 
because we were able to administer a very effective treatment at a certain specific point during pregnancy and right after to the child, we were able to really reduce the epidemic in the United States. Our founder, Mitch Besser, was working in Kritiskir Hospital in Cape Town and realized that they had meds. Folks, the doctors were actually understood what they needed to do. There just wasn't either time, there wasn't a focus or priority, and there wasn't an education knowledge among the women that were at risk. So women weren't being tested. They were coming in when they found out they were positive. They didn't know what they needed to do. There wasn't just a process or a, a focus on this. So the intervention focused on who could provide that message. Doctors don't have time, nurses don't have time. Mitch reached out to HIV positive women who had been through treatment and could talk about how difficult it was, what their fears were, what their aspirations were. We were able to tap into these women, educate them, train them, professionalize their skills, and pay them. Pay them because we expect them to work five days a week, eight hours a day, they collect data, they do reports, they track information, they do case management. How many of you in here are working at your job for no money? Okay, very few. Most of us either have to or need to or want to derive a salary to do the work that we do because it's, we believe it's important work and it's vital work. Someone's dependent on the work we do. That's exactly how we feel about our mentor mothers. So the intervention was very, very simple. The mentor mothers, upon a woman finding out she was positive in the facility, would start to talk to that woman. She would tell her her story. She would let her know that there is a future, that there is something positive to look for. She would educate her around the meds. She would educate her around what had to happen after birth, that she should give birth in a facility that should be observed. And it was very, very effective. The model was evaluated, found to have great success, and it went on the you know, Mach 5 scalability process. Before the organization knew it, they were in all the countries that I mentioned, achieving amazing results. The difficulty was that, in many ways, we probably went to scale faster than what the intervention could keep up, but also we went to scale with something that had been shown to be highly effective, that could be replicable, that had good fidelity, yet the system was changing all around us while we were implementing this program. So what started to happen was the iterative process. In certain countries, they move beyond that initial option A of nevirapine right before birth and a syrup to a child to an option B, which was to measure the viral load of women, to figure out if they needed to go on antiretrovirals during pregnancy, to figure out what had to happen for the child at birth, a long-term piece. To some countries that now do treatment on demand, option B+, plus, where a woman is tested, she's positive, no matter where she is in her pregnancy, no matter what her viral load is, she's put on treatment for life. And as that happens, all kinds of different things have to happen. Imagine you walk in, you're excited to be pregnant, you're told, okay, now for the rest of your life, you're 19, you're going to take these pills because it'll keep you alive. Mm -hmm. And come back and see us in a month when we do your next screen. Your life has been changed, it's been rocked. Not only are you worried about your pregnancy, you're now thinking about these pills, what am I going to do, how am I going to tell my partner? Our model would address that because we did disclosure, we did other things, but we didn't deal with what does it mean upon this moment? How do you prioritize and reprioritize your life when you're hearing this information of treatment for life? None of us, I'm a diabetic. When I found out I had diabetes, I did not want to hear that I was gonna be on treatment for life and that it would end up to be insulin someday. I just didn't want to hear that. And so for three years, I didn't deal with it. We can't have that for HIV positive women. We cannot have that if they're gonna have a baby in six months. So the systems all changed around us. So now that elegant model has had to start to deal with things like earlier presentation. We have to deal with demand. We can't just be in facilities because we have to drive women into facilities to get tested and to present. We have to deal with a longer term and more complex message around adherence. We have to deal with different kinds of disclosures because disclosure is a very key piece and that we know that when someone discloses their status, that they're on treatment, they have a less likelihood of transmitting to others. It's very, very important, but it changes in this space. We've also had to deal with these different treatment pieces, but we've also had to deal with changes in human behavior. One of the things that for us is so critical is women's empowerment and measuring women's empowerment. So Julie and I are gonna have to talk about this. We've been <laughs> struggling to come up with an indicator in a process. We think we have one, but 
Measuring women's empowerment is probably one of the hardest things to do, empowerment in general. But thinking about what we're doing and paying women, paying an individual that for many, this is the first formal, official job that she's had. She now has a source of income. Among her peers, she's seen as, wow, you are doing something really amazing. She has status. But she goes home to a male partner who might not have a job or who might make less than her or who wants her money and wants to make the decision on how to use it. So in some ways, while we are empowering and supporting women and changing their lives, we're also putting them more at risk. So we have now also had to do things like provide services for support around financial counseling, how to open and maintain their bank accounts, how to present the discussion of their own financial security and income with their male partners, and what does that mean? So there's a lot of different things that we have had to respond to. So this complexity issue is one that is very, very difficult when you're on the ground and implementing, and it's even more difficult when you have a set of investors or donors who think that you're X, mm -hmm. and in many ways, you're now triple X, or you're triple Y, or triple Z. <laughs> I don't like think I don't mean the triple X, but <laughs> that you are <laughs> X, Y, Z, um, that you've done and you've changed and you're a little bit different than what you started out as, because wow. what they want is the results, the action, the effectiveness that they saw when they got excited and fell in love with you, they don't realize that in 11 years, you're now an adolescent and you're very different than what you were. You're not that cute baby. You're not that cute, simple smile. You're a very much more complex organization and it's very hard for donors and investors to follow that. Yeah. That's why I invited mothers from others who joined this panel because that, that um, balance of fixed model and, and complexity plays out so much in their example. Um, before we start to offer some of our recommendations on what we do about this from our, our different chairs, um, I wanted to just open it up to you all to share how this kind of manifests itself in your world. So we'll take maybe three or so hands before we turn it back over to, to the panel. We've got one here in the front. Um, just introduce yourself before you yeah, sure. share your thoughts. Hi, my name is Rich and I work with Echoing Green. And so we support very, very early stage social entrepreneurs and one of our four key elements in working with them is helping them think about uh, rigorous evaluation of the work that they're doing that's appropriate to their very early stage when they're at an iterative uh, program yeah. um, uh, point in time. And one of the challenges for them is uh, we've started thinking about the rigorous evaluation of impact as, um, as existential for them in that there is, a, there is a chance that doing it will in fact threaten their existence as much as it can support it. And the reality of the world that they're in is that in fact there's plenty of money that isn't requiring rigorous impact evaluation. And if they take the risk of doing it, they may find out that all the systems they've built towards one very particular intervention, we're gonna deliver bed nets by bicycle using this particular population, will have very low efficacy. And then instead of having enough time to figure it out and make changes, they're in fact right out of business, which may in fact be what the field needs, what the funders want, but is a very scary moment for the social entrepreneur or for the, uh, the institution itself. And so I'm curious to hear how we can help our, uh, our social entrepreneurs, our program leaders deal with this sort of existential threat of, uh, of certain kinds of impact evaluation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably the easiest thing is we'll take a few and then add them into our responses. I see one in the back. Um, I'm Paul Hudnut from the Bohemian Foundation. I'm really interested in the recent news out of the Hewlett Foundation that they're cutting back their funding for effective philanthropy on the basis that by getting more information to donors doesn't seem to change donors' behavior. So kind of the <laughs> overarching question here is, does it actually matter if you do evaluation for someone like Frank? Yeah. No, that's a, an important one. Maybe one more? OK. Seems like we've got our work cut out for us with those two alone. <laughs> um, I think I'll start speaking a little bit from the funder's perspective, um, and I can't obviously speak for, for Hewlett and their decision, um, but one of the things where it plays out in my day-to-day -day work, um, it's a conversation about risk aversion probably first and foremost. Um, 
that the perversion, to use Annie's term, um, in measurement is when we are using it to minimize risk as the overarching kind of quality. Um, and I mean, we all know that the philanthropy is risk averse. There was a Bank of America study a few years ago that showed something like 4% of funders were willing to take um, substantial risk with their portfolio, 4%. And 25% wanted a, a risk-free portfolio. That's <laughs> it's a bit incredible. But um, what, what does that mean that we, what do we do about it? So I think there are two solutions to trying to minimize risk, and these are something that, that we try to put in play at, at Skoll. The, um, the first is differentiating in your expectation about um, an investment between the impact that you're seeking on the world, which is driving um, all of these efforts in the first place, but becomes the measure by which a lot of this evaluation is conducted, changes in people's lives, changes in the conditions of the environment. That's important to measure, but it should not be the only thing that you measure, and it should not be your only expectation for the impact that you're having with the grant, that we often over or underestimate um, the value in informing our efforts, our strategy, and, and the efforts of all of those other organizations that we work with, whether it be other social entrepreneurs that we fund or other funders that we work closely with. Um, so there are, there are questions that you can answer in conducting um, any grant. Your are questions that you're answering in conducting any evaluation that should inform your strategy. That puts you into a place where adaptation is part and parcel of the investment in the first place. That if you're trying to answer a particular question, you're acknowledging that you don't know that this is going to work. That, you, that there's something that you don't know and that you're trying to find that information with the purpose of adjusting your strategy and with the purpose of, of informing other strategies. Um, and so that means that when we are conducting um, the due diligence in, in, in developing an investment, we are not only articulating the theory of change that we see and the outcomes that we are hoping will occur, but the questions that we want to answer about any one of those segments along the theory of change. We don't know for sure that this leads to that, so we want to know if that's the case. We don't know if this is going to work. We want to know if this works there. Um, and accepting both sides of the answer. Uh, so I like the, um, the quote by Van Jones, the activist and advocate who said in a speech once that funders need to stop making grants and start funding experiments. And that, I think, is a mentality that we need to embrace a little bit more. Um, there's still, the risk aversion is minimized because you're changing the conversation about what it is that you're funding. You're not funding a guaranteed result of an outcome, you're funding a guaranteed result of a lesson learned. That's one strategy. I'll open it up to my colleagues to maybe share a couple of their own. Well, I, I can start um, just building on, very much building on what you're saying. I'd like to ad address a little bit this apparent contradiction between the use of uh, rigorous evaluations like randomized control trials in a complex world. So as I said earlier, for me, um, it shouldn't be a, a dichotomy. Um, and it's really about uh, two worlds understanding and adapting, and I'll explain what I mean a little bit. Um, I'll start by saying that I understand these complexities very well, because if you think about our own intervention, IPA, you know, our goal is to create more evidence-based decision-making. Now, The way that we do this, it's a very complex theory of change, and we belong to the types of intervention that cannot be measured with an RCT very easily, so we, we are talking, actually. <laughs> so I, I really so <laughs> live with that problem as, as an organization. But, but going back to the contradiction between, so the apparent contradiction between the use of RCTs and, and a complex world, and complexity actually doesn't mean that you can't use an evidence-based uh, approach. And for us, you know, RCTs so should, be used to, uh, should be used and designed to understand that complexity. And the lessons of the RCTs should be then adapted to a complex context. And so for that, you have to understand the context. So it's really about uh, understanding rather than evaluate or prove. Uh, and it, it's about adapting rather than 
prescribe in a rigid manner. So, so I think that that's really important and, and that's the way that we want to use um, our cities. So I'll, I'll give you a, uh, two examples. So this, there was um, some researchers uh, did an, an evaluation in India looking at uh, why in Rajasthan don't, uh, only 4% of kids are immunized. Why is that the case? Is it a supply problem? Is it a domain problem? So long story short, they, they found that um, providing uh, health camps, so improving the supply, uh, was, was very helpful in increasing uh, immunization rates, but that it was even more helpful when uh, parents were also provided with incentives to bring their kid to the health camp to be vaccinated. So, and the incentives there was a kilo of, of dal or lentils. So pretty, pretty cheap. So now what, what do you do with that result? So it's not, it's not saying that, okay, now, you know, if you have immunization rate issues, you should give parents a kilo of lentils and that would solve the problem. You obviously have to adapt things to, to the context. So that's a very easy one, but you know, People don't eat lentils elsewhere. That's just to simplify the, the argument. But you have to really understand, you know, why is it that this intervention was working in, in India? And that's, that's going back to the theory of change. In order to do that, you really need to understand you know, what are the mechanisms that led to that impact. Once you understand the why, you know, it, it becomes much easier to adapt the lessons into, into a different context. So the big lesson here from this project in India is that it's not just necessarily about supply, uh, it, it's also about demand. And it's not just about understanding that immunization is important. It's about you know, that, that little nudge. So it's like us, we don't exercise as often as we want. It's not because we don't have access and it's not because we don't know that exercise is good because you need a little nudge. So that's kind of the same type of finding. And when you start thinking, you learn something about human behavior that can then be applied into different contexts, maybe even different types of interventions. So that's one, one example. Another example is thinking about negative impacts. Because you know, we're talking about making prescriptions based on positive impacts. But there are also evaluations that show no impact. And it's really important to think, how do we think about those? So uh, one of the first um, RCTs conducted in, in Kenya uh, by Michael Kramer and others found that uh, distributing more of the same textbooks in school did not improve learning levels uh, for most kids. And that was a very common intervention at the time and still is now to just distribute more of the same textbooks or materials. Now, okay, what do we do with that? So the lesson could be, oh, stop distributing textbooks. But it's not a very interesting implication from, from this evaluation. So re it's really about understanding, okay, why did it not work? And very often you don't just understand that with one project. You start understanding, you start drawing lessons from a body of evidence. Mm -hmm. So there's been a number of evaluations looking at other types of interventions to, uh, to address learning levels. And a lesson that's, that's emerging is that you know, actually these textbooks had an effect, but only on the upper half of the class. But it makes sense because a lot of kids can't read. And that's why the interventions that really aim to target instruction at the child's level, like Pratham does in India, are so effective because they, they understand that problem. So again, it's about understanding something did not work, but why? Why, why was at stake? You know, what was the institutional context behind that? What was the human behavior behind that? Um, so, so it's really about you know, designing our cities in a very smart way so that you can start understanding those things, really having a clear theory of change, looking at subgroups, okay, it worked in average, but for whom? You know, in, in what context? So it's about looking at variations of the same interventions. You know. And for us, one thing that's really important there is to work really, really closely with our implementing partners and not just on one project, but on the next one. Because I, like you were describing, you, know, you, you had one intervention that was evaluated and then once you start scaling it, it, it raises new questions. Then you can start understanding these new questions as well and new lessons will, will come up. It almost raises the point of, is there ever a proven, a fixed proven that's bold and underlined, or there's always the case that you, not, you need to be proving gerund? Yeah. 
Just wanted to jump in as well in terms of um, Richard's question because it made me really think about just even my own kids. Um, when the question about monsters under the bed comes up, and my first child, I did the whole turn on the light, look under with a flashlight, crawl under the bed, nothing. My second child, a few years later, she wanted to find out the light under the bed didn't help. She wanted to know how long it would take for the monster to get from the closet to the bed. <laughs> she wanted to know that when she heard the creak of the bathroom, how could she tell it was us or the monster? <laughs> so we did the whole thing of literally walking, running, how fast. If she yelled and I was in my room, how long it would it take me? And I think it's that existential question, which is some of these questions will scare you to death. <laughs> and they will frighten you because what you thought was your passion, your secret sauce, ends up not being. So if someone's delivering bed nets and bicycles and they've been selling the bicycle piece because that's a cheap cost effective issue and it turns out that they could have dropped them you know, by, from kites and it would have been better, They're, what they've been doing is selling the wrong thing. It's still the bed nets, it's the approach, it's getting into the homes, it's whatever else they're doing, but they've been selling the wrong thing. What for us, I think, it, for mothers to mothers, the Part of what we've tried to do is to understand where we are in the various evaluation cycles and schemes. So understanding a rigorous piece here and knowing that you're dealing with it, and when you're done, it doesn't mean you're done. It means that you'll then, the next kind of evaluation you need to do is here with an ultimate of what. And how that looks and what kind of space and what you're going to expect, that's also, I think, really important so that folks have a bit of a road map. I think that one of the things that we've done that we've really enjoyed is that our, our model is adapting constantly, and it's adapting because I'm a, I'm a medical anthropologist. Culture changes, people change. The minute you start to address one behavior, that behavior creates other kinds of issues. And I loved um, uh, Michael Crichton's, you know, the, the Lost World, because there's a quote in there that, you know, nature will always find a way. And if someone is motivated to get to a different point, whether it's to have unprotected sex, whether it's not to have a medicine, whether it's to have 15 partners, it will happen, you will get there. So for us, what we've also tried to do is empower our staff, the mentor mothers and the site coordinators who are former mentor mothers. We have developed a methodology for a uh, QAQI, quality assurance, quality improvement approach, which we call Let's Soar, which is strengthening our approach through proven results. And it's a very, very specific process where they take key data that they're reporting up internationally to our head office, they look at it at site level, and then on a quarterly basis, we pick sites that then share their data with another. So they might be looking at an indicator like retention, and across the board, our retention numbers after first visit is, let's say, 79% of the women re return for their second without prompts. One site will say, okay, against the bench benchmark, we're at 60%. Another site will say, wait, I'm looking at our, their data, they're at 90%. They then start to have the conversation, what's happening? What are you doing different from the recipe book? Oh, well, you know, we found out that if we went to the health fairs that were happening on the second Friday of every month before clinic on Monday, we got a big bump of women that came in that wouldn't normally come in. So people start talking about the things among the, this intervention that is actually making changes or what's not working. And I think for us, that is that constant challenge of we have to know and understand what's happening on a real-time basis or we're going to find ourselves delivering the bed nets and the bicycles and the bicycles aren't important. And I think that's really important for any organization to really challenge itself. Yeah, that's fantastic. There's another strategy I just want to offer up that I think is that I've seen work uh, quite effectively, both at the funder level and with the organizations that we fund, and that's a, a portfolio diversification. Um, it's recognizing if you, if you expect or if you, if you understand that you need to balance this kind of um, fixed model with adaptation, that implies that you need to be constantly cycling in new efforts to your work. And so if you think about Mothers to Mothers or Health Leads or One Acre Fund or Root Capital, all of those organizations have a, a side project where they're constantly experimenting um, on top of their main strategy. It's the recognition that that main strategy is never fixed and that you have to be pulling in and learning and, and bringing in new ideas. And then from the, the foundation perspective, it's, it's the same. It's that we need to expect that within looking across the 87 organizations that we fund, there's going to be a mix of fixed and adaptive, not only within all of them, but a spectrum within that portfolio. Um, there are going to be some that are more on the fixed side and, and some that are more on the adaptive side. Uh, there's also, I guess this is the best case scenario, we should build in an expectation of risk within there as well. 
that, that we acknowledge that some of those are going to be easier to kind of prove the outcomes versus others. Um, it's not something that we do quite yet um, in acknowledging like there's an 80% chance this is going to work or there's a 10% chance this is going to work and naming that at the outset. But I think that's a, that would be a fantastic practice for funders to do more of. Julia? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, to make a point about something that sort of subtly came up here. Um, and uh, in, it's, well, subtly came up, but not, um, what do I want to say? I want to challenge the, the assumption that rigor and impact evaluation is sort of the domain of RCTs, um, and that, and you didn't say that, so I'm not saying you said that, <laughs> but it's sort of something, uh, sort of an assumption out in the field, and, um, and for the kind of evaluation that I do, which is primarily non-experimental, um, sort of a lot of qualitative research, the concept of rigor most certainly applies to that, um, that type of evaluation in a lot of ways. And it is possible to do impact evaluation of things that are not fixed models. Um, so it's possible to say, take an advocacy effort and identify um, the impact that an advocacy organization had on a particular policy outcome. And you can't do an RCT on that, but you can use other approaches. Um, they are non-experimental, so they're not going to give you an, a, a, de a definitive answer to cause and effect, but they will give you, um, or they can give you, a defensible and plausible case that um, one effort contributed to a particular outcome. So there are methods like process tracing, contribution analysis. Um, there's a new one in the advocacy field called survey with placebo uh, that is designed to really address the, the impact question with rigor. And the idea behind these methods is to um, say, you know, these are complex environments. There are a lot of particular things that could have um, caused a certain outcome. You're one of many. So can we eliminate other possible explanations for um, those other things that could have led to those outcomes? So it's a process of, it's kind of like CSI. You're eliminating you know, other, other possibilities so that you can have confidence that the effort you're interested in actually had um, an effect on that outcome. Um, a, a couple of other points I wanted to make about the concept of how do you think about results and impact if, you're, if you've got an adaptive, complex, um, evolving initiative. And that's just the, the notion of how do we think about what accountability for results means in that context. And, and for, for me, it's actually the same definition for an adaptive initiative as it is for a model, where accountability for results means that you're trying to identify the things that are getting in the way of effectiveness. And that could mean theory failure, so you're wrong about what the relationship, the cause and effect relationship is, um, or the set of cause effect cause and effect relationships are, or it could mean implementation failure, where your theory may be right, but the, you don't have the capacity or implementation is somehow going awry and so you're not being effective. Well, so that, that definition applies to a model. It also applies to an adaptive initiative, where um, my work would be about identifying what is getting in the way of uh, potential effectiveness. And um, it's just that the approach the approaches that we use to do that differ. So Annie might use an RCT um, you know, for, for a, a more of a fixed model or log frames or you know, some of those, those tools, and I would use developmental evaluation. But the idea of being, accountabil uh, uh, of being accountable for results is the same. And in addition, for an adaptive initiative, it's also being accountable for actually changing in response to what you've learned, mm -hmm. right? So that's an element of, um, of, a be of being accountable for results, too. Um, uh, the only other point that I want to make uh, about that, the challenge that I face in my work, is that even if you're doing developmental evaluation, there are opportunities to test cause and effect um, 
relationships and assumptions that are at play with, and there are multiple ones that are typically at play in, in a complex initiative. So for example, with the, the Hewlett initiative I mentioned about trying to address political polarization, they've, they've, done, they've decided to make what they call a variety of spread bets. Um, they don't know exactly what's going to work, so they've decided to make some bets in the area of trying to change the way Congress works um, to uh, address campaigns and elections. I know these are small, small issues. Um, and, uh, and civic engagement. So, and they've got a set of assumptions that they've funded, that if you can get members of Congress uh, to interact in different ways, that that will actually, like even bringing families together to go to a picnic, um, Republicans and Democrats, that that will somehow play out. They'll develop relationships, they'll talk to one another. I mean, they, they literally don't talk to one another. Mm -hmm. um, so that that'll play out in the halls of Congress. That's one assumption that they've got, that they've funded. Um, or their, uh, they're, they think that if you can increase voter turnout in primary elections, where it's usually a teeny tiny um, turnout, that ultimately that will increase uh, or make for a better representation during the general elections. That's another thing that they're funding. So those are assumptions that in our evaluation, we're helping them to test, yeah. to find out, is, are they right? What's the cause and effect relationship? That's not about the entire initiative that they're funding, but it's, it's some of those key assumptions that we can drill down on um, mm -hmm. and test. Excellent. Um, so then I'll open up the questions. I want to just um, offer up a couple responses to the ones that were offered earlier um, to get those <laughs> addressed, at least in part. Um, I want to make one quick point about rigor, and, and we always attach rigorous to impact assessment, and I think we just need to remind, or at least keep in mind that rigor needs to apply to all of our measurement and not just to the idea of impact assessment. And as Julie was saying, you can be rigorous in quantitative measures, you can be rigorous in, in qualitative measures, and, and that's critical. And you could be rigorous in your impact assessment, you can also be rigorous in your performance um, assessment, and w you need to apply it across the board. Um, and as to the, to the Hewlett, um, um, the Hewlett piece, so they are pulling out of the nonprofit marketplace initiative, which I chalk up more to less to funders necessarily behaving um, badly by themselves, but behavior, behaving badly with each other. That it's not, it was the idea of creating common, common metrics that we could all work on together. And I think funders need, um, there's a, a chance that we can be more responsible and more effective in starting to be more risk tolerant internally and internally driven, that that has more promise than us doing it collectively, which takes a, like a little bit more of herding cats mentality um, to do. So those are just some quick responses. But yeah, let's, let's get some more questions in here. I saw your hand up earlier, and then we've got quite a few. Omar Brownson with the Los Angeles River Revitalization. Omar Brownson, LA River Revitalization. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on sort of two sides of the same coin in the sense of blended returns versus diluted returns. And I'll use an example uh, for the Los Angeles River. Uh, on the one hand, let's just take the issue of stormwater. Mm -hmm. uh, you have environmental advocates that want to manage stormwater um, by pushing it further out where it can seep into the ground versus urban folks that want that investment more in green infrastructure where stormwater can benefit economic development, open space, which can help public health and other issues. From the environmental perspective, stormwater management is best pushed further out from sort of an urban advocate. It's pushed in and it's, how do you measure impact in the sense that from a pure environmental perspective, pushing it out is better, but from a a urban advocate getting multiple benefits. Yeah. So we are, we're saying you're getting a blended return of multiple benefits. They're saying you're getting a diluted return because you're not getting the most maximum benefit from the stormwater. And I just, it's a tension that I'd just be curious as to how do you actually balance that in this kind of methodological structure. It does. It, it's, 
Yes, talking about complexity, who wants to deal with that one? It's got attribution, contribution, and, and competing interests all wrapped up in one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is. Um, I think it, it starts with at least differentiating between what you, what you can attribute back to the program and not. There's, I mean, part of it is the, the diplomacy between competing interests and, and having funders and, uh, that are pulling you in one direction or another uh, based on a certain program. That's one that's um, going to be more difficult to deal with um, on top of the trying to say that you necessarily had anything to do with the climate factors or the economic factors is going to be another tricky one. Yeah, I'm, that's a that's a punt from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me call open. For purposes of this question, I spent four years at the Sierra Club, so uh, and twenty of it mostly raising money from funders. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have to make the observation that from that twenty years of experience, which was all in the United States, so it's not global. When we're talking about interventions where it is not getting an institution like a health service or a school to change the behavior or facilitate the behavior of individuals, yeah. where I think there's a fair openness to theory failure, execution failure, attribution analysis. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about interventions where you are trying to enable individuals to change the behavior of institutions, Funders have zero interest collectively in analyzing theory failure because they start out with a theory and they do not wish their own theories to be disproved. And I'm interested if I'm being, from your experience, since you're practitioners, maybe there's a much greater appetite there than I was able to experience, so I may be wrong. But my experience was the funders would start out with what they called their theory of change, which was actually, it was just a theory. Mm -hmm. And when you said, well, actually, and th this conversation actually happened with Hewlett on their political polarization initiative, people tried to say to them, but actually the social outcomes you say you want are not the result of diminishing polarization. There's quite a bit of data to suggest that actually you're not solving the underlying problem you say you care about. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really, in my experience, very much openness to evaluation, and I'm curious what you all think your experience has been, whether I was unfair or uniquely unlucky. <laughs> Uh, no, that, um, I think that's a common uh, issue in the field. I think one of the ways that um, I've tried to work on that with funders is to um, help them think differently about the evaluation questions that they ask. So for example, um, most funders do have a theory of change, they're very invested in it, they spend a lot of time developing it, et cetera, and then ask the evaluation question, tell us, tell us if it's working. Um, assuming that it's going to. And so what I've tried to incorporate in my work is to ask the question, well, tell, if it's, tell us if it's not working. Is there evidence, sort of disconfirming evidence out there that your theory of change is not playing out as you anticipated? Otherwise, you're gonna get a lot of confirmation bias in, in what you do in your evaluation. So that's one way that I've tried to shift um, and sort of open up more acceptance to thinking that, well, you might not be right here. Um, and it's not a right or wrong, it's what, what might you do differently as a result. I think it's really important to build on that, I think, often we think of, of impact assessment as, you know, let's test the hypothesis and let's, you know, look at how something was done. You know. And so, the word impact assessment, I think, sounds a little bit too rigid and too past-oriented. And I don't think, you know, describes really well what, what we try to do, for example. So I think one has to really be sort of future-oriented and really, it's really about thinking about program design, not really let's evaluate, you know, something that, that has been done. And so often, you know, when we, 
when we start a conversation, either with a founder or with an implementing organization, we definitely start by understanding what, what are they doing, what problems are they trying to solve, and how, and what's their theory of change. And very often, you know, the conversation leads to a very innovative idea, because you know, from the research side, we, you know, we have uh, we've, we've run studies elsewhere that we've learned from, uh, you know, the theories from economics, from behavioral, behavioral economics, and you know, you, you combine that with experience and beliefs from practitioners and you come up with new ideas. So, um, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes very simple ones. So, um, you know, the incentives for vaccine I, I described, that, that was a fairly un unusual thing to do. And that, that really you know, came up from a number of conversations. So if we had just said, okay, what's your theory of change? Let's test it to prove it or disprove it. You know, that's not so interesting. So it's more like, okay, what, sh what should I do? What could I do differently? And let's experiment as rigorously as we can. And mm -hmm. I agree that, you know, that, doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean an RCT, but let's experiment and, and figure out you know, how else we could be working. So I think it's really, you know, and that goes back to the word accountability. I think often um, we use, you know, or, and that goes back to your point earlier, I think often you know, evaluations are seen as an accountability tool. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to shift that and really think of them as a learning tool. So it's really learning for the future. And so maybe we should change the, the world yeah. in, in the fields too. You know. One other change I think that we need, and, and you heard in, in, in thematically in, in from all of us that we need to marry the fixed with the adaptive. We need to find the middle ground between them. Um, I think that plays out also in theory of change. And in, so both theory of change and kind of strategic plans are thought of more as the product rather than the process and more as the noun rather than the verb. So you spend a lot of money to put together your theory of change. You spend a lot of money and a lot of time to put together your strategic plan. And so the incentive there is to keep it intact for as long as possible, um, rather than to revise it and adapt it. And I think we need to move more to a sense of kind of testing theory and constantly uh, uh, revising strategy with the recognition that there's clearly a kind of pyramid there. There's a, there's a long-term impact that is not going to move, that if it's moving uh, too much, then your strategy is, is too shifting. Um, but that you have to allow that some of the earlier term efforts are going to uh, evolve. Some of the early term kind of outcomes that you're pursuing are going to evolve as, as culture changes, as nature changes. Um, and we need to get away from that kind of fixed uh, approach to planning. Or not do it for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Expect that it's going to play out that way. Exactly. So I see a lot of hands still. I, I don't know who was first. Maybe I think I saw your hand a while ago. Camilo from the America's Business Council Foundation. And I'm curious about whether you have an opinion on social impact bonds. Um, a social impact, impact bond, in brief, requires a counterparty mm -hmm. to pay for a social investment that yields specific results, which in turn requires, of course, a high degree of clarity on how you measure results. They have been around for a few years. However, the industry hasn't embraced them very much. And I'm wondering if you have an opinion on why this might be the case. I definitely have an opinion. We like them. We mm -hmm. And it's just been really hard to get folks to really buy into it completely. If they buy into the results, they buy into what they would buy, what they would do. It's just trying to get our issue onto their priority list has been very hard. Very, very hard. <coughs> it's competing priority. What's the challenge? So, it, so the whole concept of getting them to pay for the results yeah. for child's lives saved yeah. or infections averted, it's a very, very tough. Oops. It's a tough, um, tough sell to the broader okay. investor community. Well, I think often the challenge is, uh, I, the idea is brilliant, but it's often the challenge is actually the measurement of the, yeah. of the outcome, especially in, so in the US, you have much more administrative data to, administrative data to, to work with, for example. So uh, in, in a lot of countries, that's not the case. So you know, may have to, to do uh, like very um, involved and time-consuming uh, experiments to actually measure these this outcomes. So I think that's one of the challenges, possibly. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Taylor Downs from Vera Solutions. 
Um, and my, my question is sort of, uh, sort of twofold. Uh, our intervention is a data system, usually a, a monitoring and evaluation system, and we've been lucky enough to actually work with IPA and with, with PATH and with Prathom. I saw Madhav at the back before. Uh, so the question is, is for people who actually work in the, uh, in, in the evaluation space or in the, the measurement space, uh, and, and it's really wondering, first, how do you guys, I, I guess specifically Julia and Annie, how do you measure your impact? Uh, and then the second part of that is we are completely in agreement that uh, data should be used for improvement and not proving, not, not just creating a, a donor report. But how do you bake that into your process? So how, how are you sure that your developmental evaluation or the RCTs you conduct are used to design programs and make changes to programs as opposed to look back on what may or may not have worked a couple of years ago and, and sort of hold it up to the light? We, we struggle with this all the time. It's, it's, we're trying to figure out how we, how we grow our impact, and this is the question we're, we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Well, if you figure out how you <laughs> to do it, you can be. <laughs> um, I don't know if you have you know, another few hours to discuss this topic, but um, <laughs> no, it, it <laughs> it, it's a very good question. And as I said earlier, we do belong to the types of intervention that are hard to measure with, with an RCT. So, mm -hmm. um, so uh, we're thinking a lot about this uh, lately because we are, as an organization, increasing our focus on ensuring that evidence gets used. So you know, as a result, people ask us also, you know, that what's your theory of change and, and how do you actually measure whether that's the case or not? So for us, it's, it's really about um, you know, actually outlining the theory of change. And there is not just one. There's many multiple mechanisms through which evidence may lead to evidence-based decision making, and, and that's certainly complex. But really mapping, mapping that as well as possible and, and tracking, you know, and the other challenge is that it's a really long term, you know, changing evidence-based um, decision making you know, with the Ministry of Ghana that we're working with, it's not going to take a year. You know. So it, it's really thinking about are there short-term proxy indicators that, that we think are necessary for, you know, the long-term impact to occur. So, so that's a, a very uh, short answer to uh, what, what was your second question? Well, the second is how you actually, so your, your intervention is a behavior change intervention, right? You're trying to change the behavior at organizations and changing organizational processes. All right, how, how do we make sure it's about uh, yeah, how future? How do you make sure that that's baked in? I think it's all about, for us, it's all about relationships and how we work with our partners. So you know, ideally, you know, we start a partnership by brainstorming about, oh, you know, what, are, what problem are you trying to solve? How are you doing it? And how else could you do it? And here is what we've learned elsewhere. And maybe you could try that. And, uh, and then we you know, evaluate the thing that we came up with, or maybe something they already had sort of. And then new questions come up. And then we continue working with that partner on, on these new questions. And I think that long-term engagement where partners are involved in you know, even designing the research questions and are involved throughout the process, I think that that's really critical uh, for us. So, so we don't see ourselves as, as an external evaluator, but more as a thought partner. And I think that that's key. Um, so one example, like we're now working with the Ministry of Education in Ghana to help them adapt findings from India and Kenya, uh, among other things, the evaluation that, that were done in partnership with Pratham. Yeah. So we've been working with them for four years now to, and the translation is not automatic. They can't do the exact same program that was done in India because it's such a different context and it's the government, not an NGO. So we've been working very closely with them to understand what's different, what's similar, what was really critical that needs to be you know, retained, uh, what else could we do, and now new questions are coming up. So it's an example of. Yeah. We've got time for one last question, and then we have to call it a wrap. You've had your hand up for a bit, yeah. Um, I'm just curious, Gail, uh, Gail Northrup from Partnership for Management Development and Management Training Program in Africa. Um, I'm curious how you're, well, for one, I think this idea of, of both the, the fixed and adaptive strategies is pretty critical and a lo lot of, I, I appreciate that insight because I think it's really, vital in a lot of ways of, of working with funders to understand what we're doing and make it a learning process. Mm -hmm. I'm curious where you see um, technology in specific in the qualitative analysis processes, um, video 
vignettes demonstrating impact. And if you see that kind of gaining rigor and acceptance, and I, I think of many funders that I work with, that the higher up the conversation goes, the more bullet points it becomes. So this very complex qualitative, quantitative data bolstered with, with stories moves up in the food chain of boards and investors and becomes just those numbers. Um, and, and all of our work and evaluation, in a sense, is, is lost. So I'm wondering if there's new techniques or, you know, like using vignettes, videos, or, or something else that you think um, can counteract the, the attention span issues we might see. <laughs> and I, um, I share the concern with uh, what happens to evaluation at the board level um, <laughs> to a great degree, um, especially with dashboards and um, sort of trying to roll or aggregate data into three or four data points um, or impact into three or four data points is something that we're working on a lot um, and, uh, and haven't solved. But the, to your question about, about um, video vignettes, et cetera, there is a field of visual evaluation that exists out there. Um, it's not rigorous um, and it doesn't have credibility at this point. Um, but people are working on trying to, you know, how do you make that so it's not just anecdotal or it's not just telling an isolated outlier story here or there, but that it's systematic, that it's represent representative, that it's got sort of the rigor um, that other methods have to it. So mm -hmm. stay tuned. Uh, it's not there yet. Yeah. And I think that's really important. We had a donor that literally said, <clears throat> we want to have a 90 second, I think it was 240 second, and a 10 minute video, and they need to show the following five things. They basically <laughs> wanted us to almost naturally walk out in the field and find these examples where women were going to do the following five things, and we just said, we can't do that. It's not going to happen. We don't have the time to sit and observe for 365 days to get that one video because that's what it would take. And so I think that the question about how do you make sure it's representative, how, what's the rigor of it, and how does it get used? So it's not just contrived, it's not just something that's very Cherry fake. Yeah. 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 Excellent. I'm afraid that's all for now. Um, but feel free to grab any one of us to, to answer further questions. Um, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much Thank for you. joining us today. Thank you.